before we can kind of use it, we talked a little bit about where it lives. How are, how are firms or, or maybe your strategies actually getting their hands around it? How are we harnessing this? Um, and I guess maybe a, a, a step further back, is this the right path to continue to kind of poke around? Is reliable data the key to make all of this ecosystem continue to grow, or is there an alternative that really we should be looking at and, and prioritizing as well? I can jump in. Uh, so Coinbase really prides itself on being the most trusted brand in crypto, and that's a mandate we take to heart in every product, application, policy, and reliable data is at the core of that, right? Like there's many reasons why reliable data is at the center of this industry growth. Um, from my seat, I think institutional adoption is huge. As you both have mentioned, institutional investors, accredited investors need reliable data to assess risk, to in, uh, assess investment opportunities. And once they're comfortable because of the reliable data, we see the large scale investments that we need to see the industry grow. Um, as well as product development. So our, our developers are using the, the reliable data to create all of these new um, products, you know, whether it's tokenization, uh, smart contracts, uh, stable coins, all of this it, reliable data is at the center of all of those products, which is just going to grow and broaden adoption as well. And then um, verification, being able to audit all the data on chain, as Chris mentioned, and it's real time. Anyone and everyone can see the data. So I think it's definitely a big part of, of the growth. Yeah, I definitely agree as well. Like from, from our standpoint, and if you think about it, like the companies that are going to be surviving um, in the long run are going to be able to use their data as their point of differentiation. When you look at AI, like 90% of what AI is, it's all about your data. And so you really need to be able to understand how you can use that, again, in the context of your structured and unstructured data. Um, and like right now, you know, what we're kind of seeing in the market just generally is that only companies are only using 5% of their data to make decisions. And if you think about it, data goes absolute like that. So again, being having flexible systems where you're able to determine what is actually relevant, that is going to be your fuel and your competitive advantage ahead of your competitors, um, and also to just survive in terms of business longevity. And Neve, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up um, AI and technology, because I'm really interested and in, in curious to understand, what do we think the role of AI or technology is um, kind of maintaining and, and having its play with, again, going back to the reliability, the trust, the security, mm -hmm accuracy at the end of the day. Where do you see that kind of symbiotic relationship start to play out? Yeah, well, I definitely think like blockchain is a really good tool and an enabler for any type of system where there is a lack of trust. So with AI, you know, typically they are black box systems. And so using that as a track and trace layer essentially um, is really, really powerful, particularly when AI you know, is essentially multi-party in, in nature. You have the, the model builders, you have the model consumers that are using these models, you have the auditor, you have the regulator. Everyone needs to be able to um, access it to a certain degree. So with blockchain, you can have really, you know, tight access controls um, around that and revoke access to certain data sets, et cetera. So um, I'm excited to kind of see how this is going to continue to evolve because it really is helping remove that black box and, and bring trust and integrity to these underlying systems. Um, and that is needed, you know, when you look at the upcoming regulation um, as well. No, excellent point. You know, I think there's tiers of macro movements that we all have to kind of be lockstep in together, but then on the, on the micro scale as well, I mean, maybe, maybe Chris and Thomas, specifically, as you guys kind of enact your strategies, are there any specific processes to help you guys get comfortable or, or maybe your, your risk managers get comfortable in the, the reliance, the accuracy of the data that you're using? Any, any special, again, steps that you're taking to, again, get the, get the whole team comfortable with what you're doing? Well, I think I, perhaps I have two very good examples of how on-chain data is much is far superior to uh, traditional data that we've been collecting. Um, a lot of the quant strategies that I'm evaluating, and remember, they're trying to make money on in various different ways, but sometimes through prediction. They can see from on-chain transactions that a large um, order is being transferred into an exchange. And this is a bearish signal, because if someone is transferring um, uh, onto Coinbase, 
you know, millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin or, or Dogecoin or anything, they're probably going to sell it. So it's a predictive signal to say, hey, we, we, we probably want to be ahead of that. The reverse is also true if they're transferring it off, off chain, it's, it's, a, it's a bullish signal. They're probably putting it into cold storage and it probably wouldn't be as strong of a signal as the immediate sell um, because it doesn't have the same market impact. But I think that's, that's, quite, um, that, that's quite interesting that we can't see, we can't see these flows right, in, in traditional data. Um, the second one is a um, derivative of market capitalization. It's called realized capitalization. And it's something that we don't have in, in traditional markets. Um, it's effectively the cost basis of every Bitcoin um, that, has, that has been bought. So right now, when we look at the market cap of Bitcoin, it's somewhere around 1.4 trillion. But if we look at everyone's cost basis, um, it's, it's less than that right now. And the wider that gets, it means more and more people are in the money, which also means more and more likely that they'll sell. And if it ever flips, they probably will hold it on because people have this psychological disposition to hold, you know, to, to sell a, at a profit. So this is a metric that we can glean um, from this data um, and, and many others as well that a lot of managers are now using as alpha indicators for ways to, you know, to buy and sell um, and to make small profits. Yeah, um, I have sort of a longer term uh, sort of investment philosophy around a, holding a couple tokens from a couple chains for a long period of time and studying them for a year or you know, year and a half and then putting on a position. And I think some of our advantage is really time arbitrage. A lot of people are thinking in six month increments and I want to think in six year increments. And so I want to study these things super deeply. And so I'm, I'm really focused on working with firms like Artemis to get the most reliable data, like sort of um, fundamental data that I possibly can. And what is the right fundamental data? Um, you, know, you know, how many of these accounts are actually bots? How many are not bots? How much is staked? How, how much GPUs is committed to this AI sort of crypto network? I'm, I'm trying to kind of understand those questions at a very deep level and, and working also with the protocol teams and the foundations to make sure that they're providing reliable, good data. Um, and then working with, you know, groups that are sort of independent that are looking across protocols to make sure it's apples to apples when you're comparing stable coins on you know Solana you know how does that equal stable coins on eth um, uh, these things are really important and then lastly I think how do people try to game the metrics right uh, are these sort of it, are the growths in say uh, lending pool is it a function of um, sort of uh, incentive fees how much incentive fees are being handed out when do those incentive fees roll off you know when do the lockups end these are all things that I think really help are helpful for sort of a fundamental deep value sort of investor, um, you know, to, to get comfortable holding an asset for a long time. 